Good morning and welcome on this fifth Sunday after the Epiphany. I invite you to stand and turn to hymn number 423, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Set us free, O God, from the bondage of our sins, and give us the liberty of that abundant life which you have made known to us in your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings.
The first reading is from the book of Isaiah, the 40th chapter. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, and spreads them like a tent to live in, who brings prince to talk not, and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth, when he blows upon them and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like a stubble. To whom then will you compare me, or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name, because he is great in strength, mighty in prayer. Not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is discarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The word of the Lord. The psalm will be read responsibly. I will invite you to read the verses in bold. Hallelujah! How good it is to sing praise to our God! How pleasant it is to honor Him with surprise, praise! He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Great is our Lord, and mighty in power. There is no limit to his wisdom. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make music to our God upon the harp. He makes grass to grow upon the mountains, and green plants to serve mankind. He is not impressed to the might of a horse. He has no pleasure in the strength of a man. Hallelujah. The second reading is from the first book of Corinthians, the ninth chapter. If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting. For an obligation is laid on me, and woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am entrusted with a commission. When this is my reward, just this, that in my proclamation I may make the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel. For though I am free with the respect of all, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew, in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, 
that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I may share in its blessings. The word of the Lord. I choose to stand. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. When Jesus and his disciples left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak, even as he cast them out. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. The Gospel of the Lord. This week, I heard a discussion sponsored by the Episcopal Seminary at Suwannee between Dr. Andrew Root, professor of youth and family ministry at Luther Seminary, and the Right Reverend Jacob Owensby, bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Western Louisiana. These two were discussing the nature of pastoral leadership and church life in an age of secularization. Dr. Root was making the case that we need to get away from the idea that church is about growing an institution, about finding your brand, and that an important role of the pastor that mustn't be lost is helping people to live well so that they can die well. He pointed out that 500 years ago it wasn't conceivable that a person could exist without a concern for God. But in today's secular world, it's not only possible to go a long way without thinking about God, it's also possible, at least as middle-class people in our society, to go a long way without thinking about the fact that we are going to die. How do we find meaning in the presence and absence of God in our lives so that we have peace not only in our life but also in our death? In our gospel reading today, people were flocking to Jesus, bringing those who needed to be healed. Interestingly to me, it says they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons. They brought. Perhaps those who were ill were physically or mentally unable to bring themselves. That's certainly a possibility. Consider the paralytic whose friends lowered him down through the roof of the house so Jesus could heal him. But it's also possible that those who were bringing the ones for healing were the ones who loved them, who cared about them, and who were having the hardest time accepting an illness that may have been terminal. As many of you know, I used to serve as a hospice chaplain. 
In my experience, very often it was the person who was dying who had made peace with their impending death long before their loved ones were ready to say goodbye. Even so, making peace with our own mortality is not easy. When we are terminally ill, it means relinquishing the quest for cure, a quest that is often desperate. This treatment and that treatment, more chemotherapy, more radiation, a new experimental drug or a trial, another surgery. Hospice care means a shift to embracing the goal of comfort care. It means making peace with the eventuality of letting go of the only thing we know, this earthly life and the people we love. It means leaning fully into the realm of trust. Trust in a loving, compassionate, forgiving, eternal God who desires our well-being in this life and in death. Last week, Jesus healed the man in the synagogue. Now we read of Jesus healing Simon's mother-in-law. Word is spreading rapidly. Who wouldn't rush to see this Jesus when word has it that he has the power to make people whole again? We're told that the whole city was gathering around the door of that home where Jesus was staying with Simon. It's understandable because the truth is that we all carry wounds and illness inside of us. It's just not possible to be a living, breathing, feeling human being without carrying pain within us to one degree or another. And that pain manifests itself in different ways. Jesus cured them, but that wasn't his purpose for being on this earth. No doubt, the plight of the people he had healed and the desperation that he had witnessed weighed on him. And so he went off in the dark of the morning to a deserted place to pray. He knew these singular healings were not an answer to the deeper longings and brokenness within our world. He needed to stay focused on his mission. When his disciples found him, they were perplexed. What are you doing here, Jesus? Everyone is searching for you. In their eyes, it was clear what Jesus needed to do. Get back there and heal more people. But Jesus didn't go back. Instead, he told them they were moving on. Let us go to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also. For that is what I came out to do. The message. The message of God's presence with us, always. Of God's desire for us to be made whole, forgiven, and loved. The message of humility and servanthood, not domination and aggression. The message of gratitude and freely giving from the heart. The message of hope over all the forces of despair and evil. The message of new life when death stares us in the face. All of that bringing us to true healing and wholeness. Those all sound and are nice words. But it is those awe-filled moments when we experience the truth of those nice words that they are made abundantly real. For me, one of those most profound moments occurred when I was a young pastor in Colorado. A prisoner who worked at the Craig Rehabilitation Hospital, a renowned facility for people with severe spinal and brain injuries, had arranged for two graduates of their program to speak to our youth group. I've told some of you this story before, but it was one of the most profound experiences in my life as a pastor and is worth hearing again, even if you've heard it before. Both graduates were quadriplegics. Not being able to move any of their limbs from their neck down. When they arrived, we brought them up the ramp to the side door of the room where we were going to meet, and then discovered that their specially equipped wheelchairs were too wide to go through the door. 
That meant that the personal care attendants needed to reload them into a specially equipped van to go around to the other end of the church where there was a set of double doors. Already we were learning that life is not easy when you are a quadriplegic in a two-legged world. Once they were in the building and when we were finally settled, they began to share their stories. One had been an athlete diver, top form, top condition, who at the age of 17 suffered a terrible diving accident that left him paralyzed from the neck down. The other was a woman who at the age of 21 was in a devastating car accident, which also left her paralyzed from the neck down. Both were now in their 30s. They both talked about the anger and deep depression into which they sank in the early periods of their recovery. Neither saw any hope in life. Life as they had known it was over, and it really was. Nothing would ever, ever be the same again. Independence and the freedom to do what they wanted, when they wanted, in the way they had once understood independence and freedom to be, was no longer even remotely possible. Both were completely dependent upon personal care attendance. Watching and listening to the two of them in their highly equipped wheelchairs, activated by breathing into a tube, it is not an exaggeration to say that every one of us listening in that room was struck by the fragility of life and breathe a sigh of relief for our own healthy bodies. And that made their responses to a question raised by one of the youth all the more shocking. The youth asked, if a cure for your paralysis was discovered today, would you do it? You know, they say there are no dumb questions but that really seemed like a very silly question. Who wouldn't accept a cure if it was available? But it turned out to be an intensely profound question. Neither of our guests answered right away. There was a very pregnant pause as they gave thought to their answer, and the rest of us wondered what in the world was happening. Then each answered, carefully weighing the words that they were saying, but both saying essentially the same thing. Both agreed that the question was difficult for them to answer. They said they weren't sure what they would actually do if presented with such a possibility, but both said that the brokenness of their physical bodies had forced them to take a deeper look at their inner selves at their values, at what was really important to them. Both of them said that through the years of coming to terms with their disabilities, they had grown immeasurably in their understanding of their faith and their relationship and dependence upon God. That they both agreed they would never trade away. If becoming physically whole again would take that spiritual wholeness away from them, then they said they thought they would not accept the cure. You could have heard a pin drop in that room. Every one of us who were able-bodied in that room was struggling to comprehend what they were saying. It's one thing to cognitively hear that spiritual wholeness is more significant than physical wholeness, but quite another when you're looking at two people paralyzed from the neck down, sitting in large wheelchairs, motorized by breathing into a tube, who are saying that to you. They were witnessing to a cure that was far greater than physical healing. They were pointing us to a wholeness that had been life-changing for them even though their bodies were not healed. That 
is the wholeness to which Jesus came to witness in this world. Wholeness that is far more than physical. Wholeness that transcends the suffering and pain we experience in this world. Wholeness that comes from trusting in a loving, compassionate, forgiving, eternal God who desires our well-being in this life and in death, who leads us in a different way of living and being in this world, who brings healing through vulnerability, wholeness through brokenness, life through death. That was Jesus' message. Amen.
Thank you for that music meditation medley, Manny. We have such talented musicians at this church. I invite you to stand as you are able and to uh, turn in your bulletin to page five as we confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. page 388 in your books of common prayer. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for the Anglican Church of South America. In the diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for the clergy, staff, congregation, families, community, of St. John's by the sea. Lord, in your mercy, in our prayer. guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, in our give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, we commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled, and we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Confession of Sin is found on page 360. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. 
Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us share the peace of the Lord. God's peace, everyone. I would like to invite our vestry forward. Last week, we uh, voted in new members of our vestry. We have um, some that will be at the 10 o'clock service. We are actually meeting after the 10 o'clock service today. But those of you that are here, please come on up. Uh, Velma uh, Lee is our senior warden. Terry Dang is our junior warden. Uh, Nancy Rowe is our treasurer. And then we have um, Chucky Nakoa. Uh, Stephanie White is uh, on vestry, Sue Jennings on vestry, uh, Michelle Baldovi is on vestry, Janet Kim is on vestry, uh, we have Paula Choi, uh, Layla Diamond, uh, Bees Bryant, uh, <laughs> uh, Bryant Zane Bees, and um, Hal Halverson. Uh, so some of them are at our uh, 10 o'clock service. Vestry members, I invite you all to um, just turn a little this way. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you have been called by this congregation and by God to visionary leadership of this St. Peter's Episcopal Church. We are human, but we serve as Christ's disciples in this world. With open minds and hearts, we seek to do God's will. As appointed and elected members of St. Peter's Church Vestry, will you pledge to support one another as fellow workers in God's kingdom? seeking to discern God's direction and will for this congregation. If so, say, we will with God's help. We will, with God's help. will you freely and respectfully share your perspectives, patiently listen to opinions different from your own, and be receptive to insights from others? If so, say, we will with God's help. We will, with God's help. will you share the gifts with which God has blessed you and encourage others to do the same? If so, say, we will with God's help. Will you pray for one another, this congregation, our community, and our world? If so, say, we will, with God's help. We will, with God's help. To all of you, will you, the community of this church, support, pray for, and faithfully join in ministry with these, your leaders? If so, say, we will. Let us pray. O oh God, we pray for your blessing upon these leaders and upon this congregation. Help us to hear your word for us in this time and this place. Inspire these leaders in vision and mission and guide us all in answering your call for us. Help us to be a community of joy and hope in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And I think we should give all of the vestry a round of applause and thanks. Thank you all. As I said, we will be meeting uh, this after, well, after the second service at 11.30 and doing some initial um, uh, getting to know one another because we have some new folks that are coming on. I, I'm really excited about this vestry. I think we have an awesome vestry uh, that'll be uh, doing the work of the congregation this year. Um, we will also be meeting with Sandy, Canon Sandy Alexander, who is from the diocese and will be laying forth the uh, transition process going ahead. Uh, next week is the uh, last Sunday of Epiphany already. That means it's the last Sunday before Ash Wednesday. So Ash Wednesday this year is February 14th. Uh, we will have one service at 1130. We will live stream it, so you can come at 1130 or you can participate in the um, video on demand. Um, but if you would like, if you still have palm crosses or palm leaves from last year, if you'd like to bring them next Sunday, that is your opportunity. Uh, also, there is a movie that has been put together called The Philadelphia 11. It is about the first priests who were irregularly ordained uh, in the Episcopal Church, but they, it really starts, started a movement. And that um, movie is being um, uh, featured over at the cathedral on Sunday, February 18th, 5 p.m. in Davies Hall. 
They would like to know who's coming, so they make sure they set up enough chairs. So if you could RSVP to the cathedral, but that is on the 18th. Um, let's see. Camp Mokalea is has their information out for summer camp. There are scholarships available for all children. So whether it's a week-long event, there's a $150 scholarship for week-long. There's a $75 scholarship for the three-day uh, or day camp events. And um, if more scholarship help is needed, we can provide that. So please uh, speak with me if you have a child or grandchild or neighborhood child uh, that could um, partake in summer camp. It's such a great opportunity. I know it's complicated with summer school schedules, but if you can look at those dates and fit it in, I think uh, your, your child will really um, have a very memorable and important experience in their life. We continue to collect uh, travel-sized toiletries. Thank you to Beth for taking them to Wally House over at St. Elizabeth's, our sister congregation for the houseless ministry. Dr. Epping has a moment with music online every uh, weekday, 6 a.m. on the Facebook site and website. Bible studies by Zoom, Wednesday at 10 a.m. Constantinos is going to be uh, taking leadership of that. Jazz Vers Vespers is every Thursday at 6, and Manny and uh, Kahu Hahaheo Guansen will be um, officiating, continuing that uh, ministry in person as well as online. The Children's Christian Adventure is at 9 o'clock with Uncle Chucky and Uncle Bees and Miss Muffin. And this is first Sunday of the month, coffee hour. So make your way over to the parish hall. There are some goodies over there for you today. Other announcements are in the bulletin. We have a number of birthdays this week and a few that we didn't know about last week. I understand, Josh, that it was your birthday on the 1st. And I understand it was Ava's birthday yesterday, so we'll add Josh and Ava. It is Baptistine Ching's birthday on Tuesday. Valerie Baldovi's birthday on Wednesday. Where did she go? I know. There she is uh, on Wednesday. And Saturday is our <laughs> director of music, uh, Joseph Epping. So <laughs> I invite you all to take out your Books of Common Prayer to page 830 for the birthday prayer, page 830, number 50. Number 50, page 830, let us pray. We're praying for Josh, Ava, Baptistine, Valerie, and Joseph. Let us pray. O oh God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, on your servants, Josh, Ava, Baptistine, Valerie, and Joseph, as they begin another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Happy birthday, Valerie, and a belated birthday, Josh and Ava. And happy birthday, Joseph. Yes. Uh, travel prayer. Do we have anybody who's traveling this week? Uh, Josh and Sarah and Ava and Nainoa and Milo and Milo. Milo. We have a Milo and a Milo in this congregation, spelled the same way. Um, Milo and Aya. Yeah? Okay, we'll pray for them. Anybody else traveling? Okay, the travel prayers on the next page, page 831 at the top page 831 at the top. And I just want to say it's been so wonderful having Ava as our acolyte the last two Sundays. They go back to California, for those of you who don't know, hopping across the pond. Let us pray. Number f at, at the top of the page on page 831. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, whose glory fills the whole creation and whose presence we find wherever we go, preserve those who travel, in particular, Josh, Sarah, Ava, Nainoa, Milo, and Aya. Surround them with your loving care. Protect them from every danger and bring them in safety to their journey's end. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Safe travels. We will look forward to the next time you're here. 
As I go to wash my hands for Eucharist and as the offering is collected, I invite you to turn to hymn number 529, In Christ There Is No East or West. You may remain seated, and then when Joseph transitions to what star is this, which is printed in your bulletin, I invite you to stand as the gifts are brought forward. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. Because in the mystery of the word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts, to give the knowledge of your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you've made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your words spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. 
For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you've delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you've brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he'd given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine, We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where, with all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Together let us pray as Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. The gifts of God for the people of God, come and be fed. We invite you to come down through the center aisle, take a place at the rail, and return by the side aisles. If the stairs are an issue, just come up and down the side aisles.
I invite you to stand or kneel and to turn to the post-communion prayer printed on page 9 of your bulletins. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of Christ and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, send us out to do the work you've given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Savior. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Our sending forth hymn is number 381, O oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing.
Well, that was 381, but it sure wasn't over a thousand tongues to sing. <laughs> but it was a good one for today. So remember, uh, first, um, first coffee hour of the month in the parish hall. Girls, go, go in, in peace, peace to love and serve the Lord. Lord.